Hello, everyone. We have our seats very close together up here. <laughs> so this is uh, uh, the um, business value track. And we have uh, some panelists here going to have a discussion about building a business on OpenStack. And there are um, you know, a lot of OpenStack companies out there, a lot of established companies who are building products and services with OpenStack, and a lot of different ways to approach it. And, uh, and some of you out here I know are running OpenStack companies as well. And we kind of wanted to talk today about uh, you know, the approaches to, to entering a new market like this, um, to building out business models, acquiring customers, figuring out how to play, um, how to get funding, and, uh, and you know, just really look at, uh, at building a business in, in the OpenStack ecosystem from a lot of different angles. And the way we're going to do this is we'll, we'll do some introductions. I've got some questions, but really I want it to be as interactive as you guys want to be. So feel free to ask questions at any point. And uh, we have a microphone here in the middle of the floor, um, or you can yell and I'll repeat. And um, you know we'll just go to the audience anytime that somebody wants to, wants to pitch in. We also have a, a hashtag if you are, uh, are a uh, social introvert and would rather tweet about us than talk to us. <laughs> so you can use... Uh, Hashtag OSBiz, OSBIZ, and, uh, and we have a, a, a monitor down here. Nikki Acosta is going to help us out, and she'll, uh, she'll repeat your questions for you. But we may, uh, we may poke a little fun at you if you have to ask us that way. I'm sure there's no introverts. <laughs> it's, it's all good. So let's go ahead and get started and just go down the line here. If you guys can each introduce yourselves and uh, tell us a little bit about what you do and how you play in OpenStack. Sure. Uh, my name is Andrew Sterling. I'm the COO and co-founder of SwiftStack. Okay. We provide, um, we do a lot of development around Swift itself, and provide a control and management layer for Swift, which we sell as a as a, as a, as a product. I'm Scott Sanchez. I am director of strategy at Rackspace, and been there almost two years. Been involved with OpenStack about two and a half or so. I think this is my seventh one of these. And to see it in a convention center like this is pretty ridiculous, coming from where <laughs> we've where we've come from. So that's awesome. Um, hopefully, you all know what Rackspace does at this point. But um, been involved in helping a lot of the early companies that were in the community get in, figure out how they were going to get involved, um, and not only just helping them be successful with OpenStack, but helping Rackspace now along the way. Uh, my name is Ryan Floyd. I'm a managing director at Storm Ventures. I started the firm uh, back in 2000, and uh, we just do early stage enterprise IT investing. Uh, and one of the big areas right now for us is you know cloud infrastructure, cloud software. Uh, I've made a couple investments in the OpenStack ecosystem, um, which we can talk about. Uh, and uh, I think it's, I guess just you know, I'll make one statement about it. I think a lot of people are here because they think the technology is really amazing, which it is. Uh, I'm here because I think there's some amazing businesses that will be built around uh, OpenStack. So. Thank you, guys. So any business, you know, one of the, the, the big milestones is, um, is you know, getting your first customers and really getting across that threshold of idea and potential to actually delivering something. Um, how did you guys get your first customers in OpenStack? You know, what did you learn through that process? Why were they looking to, to come to OpenStack? Let's start with you, Anders. Yeah, so it's a great question. I think it's, so we are a small startup. Uh, we just did a Series A financing a couple of months ago, and we're rapidly growing right now. And the stage we're at, uh, where we're at, it's not about maximizing the number of customers, but getting the right customer. Because we are, it, it's about validating the, the product, validating the market, getting great customer feedback, and that is more important than the number of customers you have. So... To do th what, what we basically did is that because we are a, you know, one of the core contributors to OpenStack Swift, which is the object store system that is part of OpenStack, we have produced a massive amounts of technical content, best practices, guidance, you know, YouTube videos. So we really uh, try to be really prolific with sharing our knowledge, which have led to people coming to us asking for advice. Because we, don't have, we have no salespeople in our company right now. We're adding them this quarter, actually. But um, that would allow folks who are interested in Swift to come to us and learn more and we can engage uh, from that point on. But I think, I mean, sharing our knowledge, I think, has been the way to go. So is, I guess you could call us Rackspace the first customer of OpenStack. <laughs> yeah. um, we, we started from a different place, I think, than, than most other people did. And 
one of the lessons that we learned was that what was working for us as a provider at scale was not necessarily going to work for the enterprises or, or the other companies that were going to um, take this and use this technology or to go build for themselves. So we, we kind of adopted this very um, you know, loop style development effort, you know, ship early, ship often type model, which was not the model that we necessarily used in our own data centers to build for massive scale and support you know, hundreds of thousands of customers. So as we looked at our private cloud business, as we look at the um, work we're doing now with service providers to help them go build clouds, um, I think the advice that, that I've always given people is get out, get out early and talk to your customers. Don't lock yourselves away. And uh, OpenStack you know, has grown to this place where it's, it's big, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot of code um, and a lot of projects and a lot of complexity to it. So you probably don't want to try and boil the ocean and you know, wait two years to ship a product. You want to really get out there early and talk to your customers and, and get them something they can touch and give you feedback on. So Ryan, you were uh, saying just a minute ago that, that you are here because you see a lot of opportunity to build good businesses. Um, what do you think are some of the areas that, uh, that, that startups, existing businesses can come in and, and uh, fill in holes and um, you know, make good money around OpenStack? Yeah, so, uh, well, just to, you know, the comment on OpenStack, it, it, it is transforming, I think, a lot of historical, you know, kind of IT businesses. So I think you start from that premise. What, you know, kind of the traditional way of selling compute, the traditional way of selling storage, um, I, you know, I believe over the next 10 years, it's going to just get totally disrupted, not only by, you know, OpenStack, but, you know, by Amazon. There, there's others, but, you know, OpenStack is going to be a big part of that. Um, so today, I mean, you know, looking at it today, you know, I, I let me start by saying what I don't think makes sense. Um, you know, I think you have to be thoughtful about what Rackspace is doing and what Red Hat is doing and IBM. And I think, for example, trying to put together an OpenStack distribution, that's tough. Um, so what I think what you, what you want to do is you want to create value uh, around particular areas where customers really are willing to pay you something for it. Customers in general don't want to pay for open source. I mean, it's open source. So you have to think about what they're willing to pay for in terms of value. And so a, a high level kind of way that I usually think about it is, you know, the open source community develops for sort of a commonality across all customers. So take an area like security. Um, not all customers want the same amount of security because with, with anything in life, uh, there's no free lunch. It's a trade-off. If you're going to lock something down, you're going to make it more secure, uh, it's going to come at a cost in terms of how you have to run and manage that infrastructure. It can be burdensome. So my guess is with OpenStack, there's going to be security that's going to get added. But for a lot of enterprise customers, for example, uh, uh, you know, it won't be the security that's really required uh, for their needs. I wasn't at the NSA uh, keynote this morning. That's obviously an extreme example. Um, but I imagine there's a lot of security ads that were made there. Uh, so, that, so that's one area. Um, another area might be, you know, don't forget about the enterprise customers that are not as forward thinking as a lot of the people maybe here at the conference are. You know, we heard from Bloomberg, uh, from Comcast, from HubSpot, you know, yesterday. These are all organizations that have enormous engineering capability themselves. Most enterprises don't have that sort of capability. They don't have the money, they don't have the time, they're running a business. So think about products and services that address that set of customers, uh, because that's kind of the next wave, I hope, of where OpenStack goes, where it's not just early adopters and people that have large engineering organizations, it's enterprise customers that are used to buying more traditional off-the-shelf uh, sort, of, sort of solutions. Just a question to that, right? So the enterprise customers that are used to buying traditional package software, having an integrator come in or um, training their people on how to install that and, and run that, do, do you think that what we're seeing here through OpenStack, that that model is, is one that startups or, or other companies in this ecosystem should try and emulate? M my gut tells me that enterprises are, are making the journey away from that, right? And that they're, they are understanding, you look at Bloomberg and Comcast and Best Buy and HubSpot, all these folks that are up here, they're, they're making investments to participate in the community and, and really change that model with us. No, I think, it, uh, I'm just to quickly address, I, I think there are those customers, but I think a lot of enterprises, and I'll just be using it, you know, the typical VMware customer is not investing a lot of resources in terms of contributing back or trying to really understand. I mean, they want a solution because they've got a business to run and they don't view their job as technology. Now, there's companies like the HubSpot or the SaaS companies where technology is absolutely critical to them. So I think, you know, I think it depends. Um, 
But I do think there's an opportunity. Or you know, you take like a Windows customer, right? Somebody who's been building on Windows for years. How does OpenStack fit into that? And how do you make those, you know, nobody re typically, nobody rewrites applications for new infrastructure. That just doesn't happen. You have to make the infrastructure fit into the applications. So if you're not looking at greenfield opportunities, which I think, you know, that's easy to understand how it works. How does it work in legacy opportunities? Uh, along those lines, I, I think this is a, uh, uh, one of the things that we've heard is, is kind of a theme from a lot of the users who, who have come and talked here, and maybe there's somewhat of a selection bias, <laughs> but uh, it does seem like every company now is a software company. You know, maybe they are not uh, selling their software, but but what we've heard over and over and over again is that the, that what's driving these changes internally is basically developers are kings, and these companies want to <coughs> make their developers move faster, keep them happier, and it does seem like in, you know in some cases. It's not their business to, to ship software, but their business runs on software. Everybody's business runs on software. And uh, so it's interesting, you know, I mean, maybe there is a shift happening where um, in order to keep those developers productive, happy moving forward, they, the consumption of the, that underlying infrastructure is going to change as well. Does anyone have a, uh, have a question here that they want to throw out? Yes, over here. So do, do uh, uh, as, as OpenStack businesses, do we need to be molding uh, OpenStack and, and our offerings to Oracle, SAP, and, uh, and Microsoft? Th I think the answer is no. <laughs> and I think, I think it is, OpenStack is disruptive for, for those companies, clearly. Um, I think they can leverage OpenStack in some ways, but I think that what companies do is to have, I mean, anything that's disruptive, you need to do outside of the existing structure. Um, and an OpenStack initiative for those uh, companies is typically something you do on the side initially, which over time will become a major initiative in the company as you sort of scale down legacy infrastructure. And I think that's typically what we've seen how companies approach it. And, and the, the, um, the challenge in that the IT spend will essentially go down. And when there was, an, I think, a report the other day about you know, going to the cloud, you basically, for every dollar you spend in the cloud, you're removing between four and five dollars of traditional IT spending. And I think that's, that's, what, that's what customers are looking for, and I think it's gonna impact those traditional vendors in, in a really big way. It, you can only move so fast in your business when you're relying on someone else's roadmap, right? And, and so all of these companies out there that have made these large investments into these you know, ERP platforms or, or you know, other platforms that are really powering their business that they made decisions on 10 years ago, they're looking for ways, the developers are looking for ways to embed themselves in, in, a, in a platform movement like OpenStack and a lot of the new open source development technologies and frameworks out there to start plucking pieces out of what those older platforms used to do for them and really have a, have a, a say in their own destiny, right? To, to show up here at the summits, to, to work in the, in the communities of the um, industries that they're working in and, and really drive faster than the vendors that had been you know, delivering <laughs> their own business strategy through their software roadmap, right? They're trying to get away from that, and OpenStack's one of the real things that's driving their ability to go do that. So, Raphael, you uh, joined us here. Would you, uh, <coughs> Sorry. excuse me, <laughs> would, uh, would you mind uh, um, introducing yourself and, and uh, just letting everybody know who you are as well? Uh, yeah, I'm the CEO of uh, Innovance, which is a French uh, company specialized in open cloud technology, and we uh, are one of the major contributors of uh, OpenStack and the Ceph project, and we are based in Paris and uh, Canada, Montreal. Yes. Um, so, you know, you, you are outside of the U.S., and I know that, uh, that you've talked before about um, how, you know, in the U.S., it's very Amazon-centric when people think about clouds. But it's different in Europe, for instance. Um, you know, why is why why is it different in France? Why do people have a different attitude towards public clouds? Well, the first reason is uh, because we want to keep our data in the country, <laughs> and I think uh, if uh, Amazon opened a data center in uh, France, it would be different, maybe. 
the second reason is uh, because we are not really ready yet for the cloud infrastructure. And in terms of uh, business development, the infrastructure part, the software, the hardware, is not the problem in France. The problem is more the change management. In the large company, we have uh, the syndicat, which uh, are very powerful organization to defend the right of the employees, and it's good. But uh, when you want to change something and when you want to redefine the function of an employee, it takes time, long time. And when you talk about cloud project, it's not about a server. The, the infrastructure is just a tool to do something new. And to do something new in the cloud, you have to use the API, you have to give more power to the developer team, you have to break the separation between the IT team and the software development team, etc., etc., etc. And uh, in France, this is the main problem for our customer. It's how I can reorganize my company to be able to uh, exploit the, 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 the maximum of benefits of the cloud infrastructure. It's not about technology, it's right. about uh, people. Yeah. So, um, so, Ryan, I've run into several people here who are uh, at this summit and they are starting up businesses around OpenStack. And, um, you know, right now they are kind of at that, at that very early idea, you know, first kernel of, a, of an idea stage for their, for their company. Um, you know, you are an early stage investor. What is just some, some general advice when you're in a hot space like this? I'm sure that you hear OpenStack pitches and, and you meet a lot of OpenStack companies. You know, what, what's just some advice for how to approach uh, funding and kind of getting into business? Customers first, funding first, product development first, you know, what, what are uh, the different approaches and what's, what's your input on that? Um, well, it's, it's a, um, and it's a, lo it's, a, it's a long answer, so I'll, I'll try to make it short, but the, uh, <laughs> it's a lot in that. That was um, a simple I, I, question, I, I, come on. <laughs> so how do you start a company? Um, uh, <laughs> I'd say no, number one in, in, in OpenStack, because it is such a big project, I think focus, I guess, would be the first thing I'd say. Um, you really got to focus right now uh, because there is uh, a lot of large companies. There's quite a f number of startups. And just OpenStack is huge in terms of a project. And uh, to expect that you know anyone is going to have be knowledgeable enough in all the different areas to sort of go at something that's large, that's not credible. Uh, let alone uh, you know, the amount of money it would take to kind of go do that. So I think focus would be number one. I think number two is you know trying to vet it with some uh, with some potential customers. What you know be really crisp about what is it? What is the value that you're providing uh, beyond just OpenStack in the ecosystem? And where do you kind of fit into the ecosystem? Who's your partners? Who kind of might be a competitor? Um, and and try to kind of understand that because I think that's important to how you think about building the business. And probably the third thing, I guess, I would think about is really how are you going to make how are you going to make money? Um, because in open source, uh, it may yeah it may, <laughs> may, may sounds crass. <laughs> Why do I think about that? Uh, I mean, in open source, it's tough. It's tough to kind of balance between uh, you know community and the kind of want of open source versus creating a business. And I think, m my opinion, having invested in open source companies before. Uh, it's very important to be <coughs> thoughtful about that at the very beginning because if you're not, you can get crossed up uh, very quickly. So, Anders, what model did, did you guys choose in, uh, for your revenue and to, you know, to make money in, in open source? Yeah, we, uh, it, was it was a really interesting process. So we were building a storage, like a storage company we're building. And when we, when we did our basic our research, homework, due diligence, before starting the company, we talked to a lot of people in storage. Um, everyone we talked to said, you got to build a hardware appliance. That's the model of storage. Okay. Um, then we talked to customers or prospective customers, a lot of them, uh, and said, "We said, do you want an appliance? No, we don't want an appliance. We want software, and we because we can procure our hardware cheaper than you can, and we want to have control of that layer. So, so we decided to do something what which was sort of the experts in the in the storage in the industry was sort of the, de the default model had advised us against, but it was the right thing for the customer." And what they were looking for specific around the OpenStack Swift, Swift was um, the, the, missing sort of the missing part of, of OpenStack Swift was sort of the management control layer. 
and that is what we built out as a, essentially an add-on um, which we are selling as a product uh, on the, as a subscription license. But then we actually couple that with supportable Swift as well as uh, the actual management layer. But the two must be combined because if you just do support, you're going to have this combinatorial explosion of versions, packages, and whatnot, and it becomes a very expensive model to support. And with having a sort of a common, not just can we sell a product on top of Swift, but it also allows us to get a consistency on deployments so we can support these uh, you know, our customers at, the, at a very low cost, as opposed to doing it on a sort of one-off uh, consulting basis. And, and Scott, um, I know Rackspace has several different ways that, uh, you know, the obviously the Rackspace public cloud is, is one way to do that. Um, what about on the, uh, on the private cloud going into enterprises? What's the, what's the business model there? So for us, we take community OpenStack code. We put some tooling around it. So in a, in a similar model, um, we're not licensing the, the tooling. It's all, it's all open source. And our model is that we're a cloud operator. So we have you know, a huge public cloud footprint that we built and operate with <coughs> OpenStack. And with the private cloud, we're basically making a portable version of that that we will also operate for customers. So they can really focus on using it as opposed to having to have the expertise on how to architect, deploy, um, you know, engineer, and then operate it on an ongoing basis. So they take advantage of everything we're doing in our public cloud, and then we operate it for them privately in their own data centers. So <coughs> you know, we, we've, we're, we've, I think, figured out a good blend between supporting the community, and then all our engineering goes into the community code, which we then you know, kind of package up and operate for the customer. I will say that a lesson we've learned over the past, you know, two years more or less of being in this business is that the more you can help the customer actually use this stuff, the more valuable they will see you um, in, in their business. So you know, when, when you walk through the, the show floor here, almost everyone there, I don't think there's anyone really there um, except for a, a couple that are focused on using any of this. It's still all about go build a cloud. Um, and the more I think that we as a, as a community and you know, startups, if you're, if you're here to, to learn and think about, you know, starting a business here, really focus on what people are going to do with this as opposed to just serving that IT user crowd that's in the data center operating the stuff because the value is using it, not running it. And you want all of those customers for yourself. Well, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> so, <coughs> any other questions out here? Yes. I'll take a first stab at this, but we all have stakes in, in this answer, I think. Um, <laughs> so from Rackspace's perspective, the question if you're on the other room was, you know, if you're contributing to the code and then running a business based on that code, how do you um, keep from any conflicts of interest? The way Rackspace does that is through transparency. So for example, Monday before the summit started, we announced that we were going to go build public clouds for service providers and telcos around the world using our platform um, instead of just ourselves or for enterprises like we've been doing. It's transparency. So we, we early and often, same way you, you know, recommend the ship code, we, we ship our strategy out there and make sure that everyone knows our intentions, our motivations, so that as we sit and design summit sessions, as we sit in other meetings, um, there's no question of what, what is Rackspace doing with this because we try and just be very transparent with the community, with our customers, with the market. And in our case, we try to have, I mean, it's pretty clear delin delineation what uh, anything we do that goes into the core store system with OpenStack Swift that is, that is open source Apache 2. And in our case, we build a management control layer sort of that is decoupled from that. So it is actually pretty clear delineation. Um, but I think transparency is critical and I think anything we do in, in the core needs to stay open source. Uh, what, what do you think uh, could be a conflict of interest in this case? Okay, sure, but uh, we are a business company, so if you want to develop a functionality, generally, customer asks them for us. No, so, as we said, infrastructure is just a tool. We have to provide the good features for what our customer wants to do. At Innovance, we only contribute to the core. We believe the upstream should be the, the, the key. 
you have no proprietary features or specific module, we push all in the upstream, but uh, you're right, sometimes you want to push a new features because the companies in France, in Europe, want to have this, and our job is to convince them that it's better to push these features in the upstream than to develop uh, outside of the project and have a high uh, cost of maintenance after that on these specific features. So for me, it's not a uh, conflict uh, of interest. It's just what the, the, the market wants we want to do. Yeah, but we make money on the open source ecosystem. We make money because uh, this guy develop a features, because this guy develop a features. So this is a <coughs> this is the rule. We I develop features, I give it to them. This is the the key. This open source stuff <laughs> it uh, doesn't that, exist yeah, if we don't play the game. I think that that speaks a lot to what you were saying, Ryan, where you have to find the the value around it and and stay out of uh, areas that are that are too crowded and. They're just core. I mean, anything that's core, like to your, to your core, you know, it's a feature you contribute. Just assume you're, yeah, your competitors are going to use it. I don't see that as a conflict. That's just the reality of, you know, of the, the core project um, versus something that's maybe somewhat more of a satellite. So the, the, the comment was you may want to delay contributing a feature because it may give competitors uh, some kind of unfair advantage in the ecosystem. If that's the mindset that you're going into in an open source community like this, it's the wrong mindset. It just means that you don't have enough value to add to your customers outside of that. That would be my comment to that. And if you think about it, I mean, we operate in some enormous markets. I mean, computing, networking, storage. I mean, these are like tens of billions, of not, I mean, hundreds of billions of dollars markets. And this is about growing the pie. And I think if my competitor could take what we contribute to the core, we are, that's, that's awesome. Because ultimately, we are operating some enormous markets here. And I think if that can advance the overall size of the open stack market, we are going to be better off. Yeah, I mean, when, when Rackspace said we want to, let's go create open stack, let's take some of this code that powers our business and release it to the world along with NASA, people are like, you guys are crazy, right? Um, why would you do that? And well, aren't you all glad we did, right? Like, look, look at what this is. Uh, has a lot done, of right? people work for Rackspace too. Exactly, right? It's you know. It's <laughs> so, um, Anders, to that point, uh, y w you know, these are massive markets, and we're we're talking about conflicts of interest and enabling competitors. But who is the competition that you see when you are going out and, and selling, you know, your storage tools? Are you uh, are are you primarily competing within? Sort of the OpenStack ecosystem? Or are you going and competing against um, existing storage installations? You know, what what are the what are the competition yeah. out there? Great, great question. It basically falls down in, in our case two categories. Um, <coughs> we work with um, with customers that run to such a scale using public clouds that they bring things in house. Uh, in our case, it's predominantly Amazon S3. Uh, they, they they come to a point where they want more, more control of the data. Uh, they want lower cost more flexibility, um, and in those cases, we, we people are coming off the public cloud and bringing it in-house. Uh, then we have folks, uh, the other category are folks that it have used traditional storage solutions and that haven't really met their need, or, that, or it has met their needs, but it's been extremely expensive or, or complex. Um, I mean, for instance, you know, you know, one of the benefits of Swift is that it can support a really high degree of concurrent users. Uh, with a traditional storage system, you could achieve that, but it's going to be very complex and very expensive. We have to shard your users. It's, it's a, it can be quite messy. Um, and those customers' needs really has not been met by existing storage solutions, and I think and they're coming off those, those uh, traditional cloud, cloud solutions. And I think a huge driver in that is the move to using off-the-shelf commodity hardware, uh, using even things like not even enterprise drives, using desktop drives which has a fundamental impact on the eco economics of the hardware you're procuring. <coughs> because of the durability properties of Swift, you, we, we work around that. So I think that's, uh, I think those are the two primary ones. Scott, what about you? The, the decisions that we see from customers, especially big enterprise customers, is not necessarily you know, which, which provider of OpenStack solutions to use. 
it's, is it going to be OpenStack or is it going to be the old way that we've done it for a long time, right? The, the, the old vendors or the new vendors is, is more the question as opposed to vendor A or vendor B from the OpenStack ecosystem. Um, and when there are multiple uh, OpenStack folks involved, it, it's more collaborative, I'm finding, than competitive. You know, someone may pick something but want some more management or want some integration services or, you know, help getting started or, you know, they, they, they put multiple pieces together <coughs> in the ecosystem because we have all started to do a good job of differentiating on the value we're bringing as opposed to, well, you either buy OpenStack this way, this way, this way. It's, no, I'm going to make a decision for OpenStack and the community has such a, a, a strong alliance to the trunk and the core of what OpenStack is and, and we're all you know, moving towards this model where we're, we're differentiating at the edges as opposed to in the middle, which is great. Um, and, and so I, I don't think there's so much competition today. It's competition with the old mindset of, well, if I just put another few million dollars into this system or that system that I've had for a long time, I'm not gonna lose my job. But man, if I do it this way with OpenStack, I'm gonna really accelerate my ability to innovate in my business. And so that's, that's the decision point that we see customers facing. Okay, questions, anyone? Right, right here on the uh, on the inside. Uh, so Mike's a little bit before all of this. Uh, Nate Dill tweeted at OpenStack was downloaded two weeks ago, and so it's more a vehicle of business. Um, kind of like the dream team of people that should be working on it. Is it to roll it out to the public? Is it developers? Is it admin? I mean, what? I mean, I'm, I'm pretty three or four people who try to make something out. They fail in their own product at first, and then after the fact, what what does that do? So what is, what is a, the makeup of a, of a team to set up an OpenStack deployment need to look like? <laughs> well, I, I know the, the answer. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> great. Uh, we have uh, uh, several team in, uh, at the Innovance. You need uh, network engineers because uh, if you want to build a big cloud infrastructure, the network and the storage will be the most complicated uh, part. We also have a DevOps team, uh, which uh, have a com um, competence in the system administration, but also in development. And we have a third team on Python development. I, I would give you some other advice, which is uh, I've coined the term crazy cloud, um, which is when you download the code and then go lock yourselves away for a period of time um, with people that have never done this before and go build something that no one else can recognize when you're done. So please don't go build Crazy Cloud. There's lots of folks here and in, in the hall that can help you with all the learnings that we've had getting there. And you, you know, there's a giant ecosystem of people that can help you. So don't don't try and necessarily just go at your go at your own. Get some get some help would be my advice. Right. And and it's and it's also a um, it's Every time, it, the building it yourself is not necessarily the right answer in all cases. I think it's important to look at, at bo both. I think downloading the open source bits, I mean, trying them out and getting a good understanding for that is really important. But also look at, you know, there are vendors that provide expertise because ultimately many of us, the value we provide is, is reducing the amount of complexity you have to deal with. And I think that is a, you can build that or buy it. And uh, so you have to think through the, that. And, you know, Rafael mentioned networking. We spend a lot of time with networking. It has nothing to do with Swift. But it's you have to really think through those layers and having those those folks on the team that is really is, is, is critical for any deployment. So there was uh, another question over here. Yes. Um, yeah, I was wondering, um, as everyone who pursues this altruistic goal of making sure OpenStack is a better player kind of aligns, is there a danger that you see of marginalizing the main value add? Like, uh, you know, many companies provide great tooling or Eventually, it's going to get to a point where it's so good and core open stack that there's a smaller and smaller margin that gets passed it. And or, or maybe is it just the, the idea that in any large ecosystem, a single company with a focus is going to be agile enough to stay ahead of what's coming next and, yeah. and work in the open stack? May I just, just take, a, I'll take a stab at it just quick? Uh, it's cause I think it's kind of related to what I said uh, earlier. The way I see OpenStack uh, from an enterprise standpoint, it's going to be it's going to be like eighty percent of what it, every enterprise needs. Um, but there's going to be that twenty percent, unless I'm making the numbers up. But there's going to be some margin 
that is going to be unique to each company in terms of whether it's security or, or whatever. And so I think that's the piece that I just don't see it getting marginalized because it's just not in OpenStack's best interest to incorporate all those burdensome characteristics for a small group of users. Um, and, your turn. And, no, I, I agree completely. And that goes down to if you're starting from scratch now to go build a business around this stuff, focus on how people are going to use it, um, not how they're going to install it or – um, or, or run it because that that's the part that is going to get easier and easier for people to do. So it might, there might be a huge opportunity on that still for the next 24 months. But if you're looking, you know, five years out, where does my business go? It's people are going to worry about using it. And if you're going to go build it, you should build something that they can go use, right? Yeah, the low-hanging fruit is going to get picked, and you're going to have to do something higher. Um, here in the middle. So my question is that uh, when you're looking at funding a company that is built on OpenStack, is there a requirement for a product, or do you fund companies that do professional services and things like that only, or do you see any risk with that? So I've been wrestling with that question, to be honest. I have a good friend um, in, in China that's got a consulting organization. Um, we don't invest in China, but independent of that, just a services organization. Um, I'd say as a general rule, let me just generalize, regardless about me, but for venture investors generally, are not funding services businesses. Uh, because it's hard to get a lot of leverage out of it, uh, where you can where you can add a lot more venture dollars and grow a whole lot faster. Because what 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 gates the growth of a services business is your ability to hire people. So my advice to an entrepreneur that's trying to build a services business is probably better not to take venture money, or if you do a very small amount, because the amount of equity you'll have to give up versus the return, it probably the math probably won't make as much sense. Versus a product company where you can get more leverage out of a sales channel whether it be direct or indirect, and then adding venture money on, on, on top is like pouring gas on a fire, and you know, and, and then it's a rocket ship, and then, and then, then it sort of works. And, and there are a lot of very successful examples of companies that are known as services companies, but provide those services on a, on a product, right? So if, if your passion is to go be in the services business, maybe what you need to do is to go partner with someone that has a product and, and be the services for that product, or go build something that, that fills some of that value, and then go build a big team to go help people use it, right? Thank you. Uh, I saw a question over here. Yes. So, uh, question for Ryan. Uh, I see that you are in this issue about the market of free and open use of Do you think that the market should be added to the uh, see, The question is, so companies like Sugar CRM have a free version and an enterprise version, okay. and is that model valid today? Um, I won't comment on sugar because I know Larry Augustine really well. So, uh, but but uh, Generic ge just generically freemium versus you know an enterprise product. Yes, I think it does work, uh, but I think it depends on what the situation is. Um, I think if you're giving users the ability to try a product out and to use it and derive value from it before you're asking them to commit to paying, I think it's a great model. I think it's a great way to get people excited about your product. It's a great way to get other people using it. That that all works. What I think doesn't work is a crippled product. I think that's a bad experience. If you deliver a bad user experience on your freemium product, you shouldn't have a high expectation people are going to pay you for it. Uh, so I think you have to be thoughtful about it, and it depends on what the business is in terms of whether or not that model will work. I think it also depends on the, uh, the environment, too. In an environment where there are, like Linux and um, an OpenStack, where there are a lot of good experiences or you know, a lot of options, then it, then it does become harder to just have the... Uh, the sort of the basic pay for uh, use there. Other questions? We've got a couple minutes left, so if you've been holding out on your question, now's the time to share it. Is there a question over here? I, I would say that it's not um, out of scope, but it's uh, it's a little early to to figure out exactly what that looks like. And it's something that we've we've um, you know been looking at, uh, especially kind of towards the end of this year, because one of the one of the big goals that we've had for this year is um, creating a clearer path to adoption. And uh, and that's one of the you know if you go and you talk to people who are here that are prospective users, um, or you know 
people who who downloaded it two weeks ago. You know, one of the things they want to know is, okay, what do I do now? Did, so I got the, I got the download, and now I need to put the team together, or is there somebody that I should go talk to to help me, or should I go download Red Hats or Rackspaces or Canonicals? And um, and I think that uh, that it's it's actually really hard to have a good set of answers around that right now, just because of the stage of the market. But I think that over time, um, you know, in the next 12 months or so, giving people a, a clear way to make those decisions, you know, you have a uh, you have a DevOps team, um, you know, then here are options for for getting the, the the building blocks, you know, the Legos to build your own house. You have traditional IT staff and applications, and you want everything pre-built and operating for you. I mean, something like that is is a model that we're thinking of for how to get information out there and try to again create a clear path to adoption. Anything else? Yes. So I'd say Rackspace, and this is going to sound like a cheap answer, I'd say Rackspace has kind of productized the service, okay? So it's not a consulting organization. Rackspace doesn't try to be everything to everybody. It's got a very particular service, in my opinion, that it offers, and it does it extremely well. Um, as compared to a full-blown consulting company that gets hired to do a scope of work, and each project's a little bit different, and it builds out by the hour, and so, so it's much more of a product company, although it's a service. I'm an investor in a company called MetaCloud that delivers, open, it, we call it private cloud as a service. And they basically help companies stand up uh, OpenStack clouds, and then they manage it remotely on a per socket basis as a basically a SaaS business. Is it a service? Yeah, technically it's a service, but it's, you know, they've kind of productized, so it's really SaaS. And that, was, that was essentially my comment a few minutes ago, which was, if you really want to be in the services business, find a thing you can put that service on top of and even build that thing to, to go do that. I think it's difficult to say if we are a service company or a software company because we have uh, like 50% of our employees which are software developers. But because we just believe in the upstream and we don't make money on the software development, we have to monetize the professional services and managed services. And this is a, and it's very difficult with the investor to explain that. <laughs> I know that because uh, next week we will uh, announce we just raised uh, eight million dollars to increase our productivity in several countries. So I'm in the end of this round and uh, <laughs> I understand if you, it's difficult to make money on OpenStack on the service side because the investor doesn't understand how you can scale uh, your business. But if you want to contribute to the upstream, you have to make money on the service side. It's mandatory. So it's a new paradigm, and the we have uh, a problem with all the investors. All right. Well, uh, that is our time. So um, Anders, Raphael, Scott, Ryan, thank you guys very much for uh, for your input and contribution. Thank you. Thank you.